Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? I have a sense that a couple of folks might trickle in from the workday a little bit later. Uh, so we'll see how things go. But uh, it's so good to be with you. Um, hopefully you got a chance to preview or take a look at the things I put together. Mm -hmm. I keep not, we keep not getting to everything that I'm thinking we'll get to and I kind of recycle and repackage a little bit. So forgive me for that. Uh, but I've now got a sequence of three things. Even if we don't get to things, I can uh, pass them your way. So you've got some other reading material or things to look at uh, if we don't cover it. Um, before we do anything else, I'd love to bow in. Uh, and what I mean by that is I will go and offer incense um, and then offer the robe chant, the verse of the robe, which is on page 13. I started numbering these completely. So the back of the first page that, that I sent out, if you want to, in case that's not familiar to you. Um, so we'll chant that three times. And as we do this, my encouragement to you is, that, Rosemary, I'll ask you to just mute everyone because the voices on Zoom are a little funky, right? So it's hard to follow. But my encouragement to you as you bow in and as you see me offer incense and then uh, offer the verse of the robe is try to keep pace as best you can with my voice in an embodied way. So that will be an opportunity for us to experience this form, even though we're at a distance from one another, um, because that's part of what I want to explore with you today is just the possibility of forms, even in this funky online space. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, hi, Ann, how are you? <laughs> um, all right, so let me go offer incense. I'll try and move chairs out of the way so you can see a bit. Thus is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Rosemary, you can unmute us if you want. That'd be lovely. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to start that way um, was to experiment with forms uh, a little bit today. So, uh, and I'll ask you to just reflect on your experience of our various forms. If you've been sitting or chanting or coming in the mornings, I know folks have had different levels of experience with that. And so we'll begin there. And one of the reasons I, I got curious about this was because I, I brought this to Peg and saying, one of the things I was wondering about for so many of you who are online is the, the experience of being in the Zendo side by side and sitting some, with someone in an embodied way is really important to our practice. And it's a really nourishing part of our practice. And I was asking her, uh, what are some things that we can do online to really create that sense of connection to the forms and to each other and create that sense of Sangha? Um, and she she gave a couple of recommendations, which we'll explore, but one of them was attending very closely to the words of the facilitator, the person who's offering service, and especially during chants, really being mindful of trying to keep pace and rhythm with the person who's offering that. So you have a sense of being one voice. Uh, when you're in the Zendo, that's very apparent. Online, it's a little different, but it can become itself an expression of mindfulness that way. Um, and then also being really mindful of how we bow uh, in those spaces and, and hold forms that way. So I just wanted to offer her offer that reflection first. Um, 
And then rather than write about this, I just had the first question is, how do you experience our various forms? Um, and was curious even how you just experienced that little offering to start off our time together. So just jump in, share. Yeah, so, Yeah, so it's funny that um, my relationship with forms is, is very interesting to me. Um, and my experience of this particular uh, versus of the robe mm -hmm. and the coming together was feeling like this is a possibility. Is a possibility. I'm I'm talking about. I'm chanting about the possibility of um, this formless field of benefaction. Um, and. And that really resonated with me today. I don't, it's not easy. It's not for sure. It's not always, it's not even very common. Mm -hmm. The formless field of benefaction, but mm -hmm. it's a possibility. And as speaking to or, or chanting about the possibility of that happening seemed to, seemed to speak to me this afternoon. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> I will name I'll, I'll name just to, as when I was new to Zen and particularly new to Appamata, I felt the forms were really uncomfortable. Mm. So I'll take that lens. I now have come to revere them uh, for a set of different things that I might share about later, but I always felt, um, and I, I think I maybe said this with Anne when I was leading service every once in a while, I just, it feels, I feel awkward. Like my body won't do the things that I want it to do and feels strange. Uh, you know, I grew up the son of a minister, so we don't do bowing <laughs> in, in that particular lineage or history. Um, but as I practiced a little bit longer, I think uh, I've come to relish the small things that are available to you in the way that forms kind of curate a particular kind of experience mm. um, and allow for a sort of connection when you are doing them side by side with others, be that in person or online. There's something beautifully inviting uh, where it sort of creates a sense of Sangha and community in a way that I really now love. Jay, what were you going to say? Sorry, I'm going to oh, no, Yeah, no, no, no. It's all good. I, I love watching people um, perform ritual. I don't know what it is. I just, I, I admire it, you know. Um, my, <laughs> my Catholic um, uh, upbringing, uh, um, I, 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 I don't have altars because of that. I, I, you know, <laughs> sorry. I'm like, I, I, <laughs> God, sorry guys. But, um, I do love watching other people's, um, form and rituals. I, I get, I don't know. It, it, it brings me joy to see them, you know, going through with stuff that brings them that much joy and whatnot. Um, but I do love like, when so when you were saying the um the chant i love when i'm saying it with someone and hear the 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 synchronicity of it it just always makes me feel connected you know so i i always say it out loud because when i hear my voice and that person's voice kind of merge kind of thing it's always gives me uh like a spiritual ooh, jolt or mm -hmm. something yeah mm -hmm. so I usually do like a own chant, you know, like I listen to an own chant and when the synchronicity kicks in, it just, I don't know, there's something about it that always makes me feel super connected. So yeah, I love that. Hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Buddy. Yes, I, I came to meditation just be, as a plain meditation without any spirituality. And then I came to Buddhism 
uh, taking part to a retreat with Flynn. And it's, for me, I realized that the rituals, the chants before, were something so precious and that they were nourishing my spirituality and nourishing my feeling of being part of something that I, I really love them. That's all what I wanted to say. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Rosemary. Um, yeah, I, um, I love them too. And, um, you know, the um, connectedness is interesting. I've never practiced in, you know, in person with anybody else. It's always been, you know, it's just since the pandemic. So it's always been on Zoom and, and here. And um, my initial starting to just meditate was focusing on the breath. And so everything with the posture and the forms became a way of understanding the embodiment. And like, like Jay, I grew up Catholic and it's like the body was not a good thing. And so this was a whole, um, um, you know, reintroduction to how, well, how does that work? And so the forms for me were a lot about um engaging my body with what we're doing and um when i um i might have said this last week when i put my altar together about a year ago that was just that was just another way of engaging the forms and and it's it it um i collect my body immediately i start at my door as if you know this is my zendo i start at my door with you know, my hands this way, and I have a deep breath, and then I walk slowly to the altar, bow to the cushion, and so I have my own ritual that immediately brings me into, I guess, mental focus, kind of. Thank you. Helen. I was uh, actually, I was going to ask um, when, when you read the verse or the chants during um, ceremony daily in Apamata. Uh, for me, uh, I love it because I um, connect with what I'm doing at the end of the ceremony, but it's not very easy to follow. So sometimes it depends on who's taking the, the service. And I'm trying to look over the pages and I don't find the chant and things like that. So when they are finishing, I'm just, you know. So uh, I don't know if there's like a process, probably they could say, oh, it's page three or whatever. I don't know if that's possible. And also the koan that they read, um, you know, the, the, this phrase that they read daily, it's a different one. Um, the quote. The quote. Oh, the quote. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if it's published because sometimes I don't get it either. But well, mm. that's my problem because I don't speak very well. Thank you. Well, and you speak beautifully, Melan. Um, that that is not the issue, really. No, and I, I hear you on the, the as each of us leads service a little differently. You'll notice variations in what seem to be very consistent forms which is part of the beauty. And you also see that some of us remember to read the uh, page numbers and don't. I am I'm guilty of forgetting to do that sometimes. So thank you for reminding me. And <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much, Melin. I really appreciate your input. It's really important. Um, and as somebody that sometimes is the person that is leading, the morning service, it's called doshi. That's the Japanese word for the person that's leading the gathering. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I really appreciate your instructions, your, your recommendations, I guess, about, okay, say the page numbers and maybe put on Apamata groups, the is that where you would find it the uh, quote for the day 
Mm. I know Chris look Chris took a picture recently of one and posted it. And I think he posted it on Appomattox groups. I'm not sure. Um, but that's a really good thing. And I can bring that forward to other people that perform the, the role of Doshi and say, please, there are people that this is not their first language. And, um, you know, they're, they're kind of working at it and we can, we can help them by saying the page numbers and by putting a photo of the quote on Google Groups. So I really appreciate Melan you saying that. That's that's really important. Thank you. And and, and can I just say it, it doesn't necessarily have to be about um, English not being their first language because I know when I first came I didn't know and I was like ah you know everybody else seemed very aware. And I'm like, okay, I'm lost with this. But, um, you know, over time, um, because of how my mind works, I, I, it's memorized for me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But everybody, our minds work differently. And what's easy, English can still be your first language and you're still at a loss. So perhaps even if they put it in chat, hey, we're going to cover these pages for this ceremony. That way the person knows ahead of time rather than you know in the middle of service that's lovely. in the middle of service you're saying okay page 13 page you know that's kind of awkward right but ahead of time if you put it in chat then everybody is already aware and can get there but yeah it has nothing to do with first language i think so yeah yes claudine <laughs> <laughs> yes <And I> <laughs> I think you all are pointing to uh, we're we're still learning how to do this online and in person thing together and working out the things. The forms in person, I mean, in, in the seven years that I've been here, have changed and shifted a little bit over time, but they are largely and they're largely consistent. There's subtle movements, slow changes uh, with the online things. We're still figuring it out. <laughs> so thanks for your patience with us, Lily learn all this and uh, i'm glad you're mentioning this too because i know that just shifting hats the i know the board and i think the councils are well are working on a group that will start thinking about how do we do this hybrid stuff together uh and so that we can be online and in person in a way that's nourishing for all rosemary you had a thought you're muted rosemary Uh, yeah, regarding the service, someone had suggested that when some people come for only the second part to repeat the quote, and I thought that was a great idea. Um, so that's something that I would suggest. That's a nice thing to do for those coming for just the second sit in the morning. Um, um. <laughs> So let's carry forward your suggestions and well, uh, pick up an those. Oh, up. sorry, Anne, I didn't see your hand in the corner. Yes. <laughs> and That's sorry, okay. can I just say, Anne, before you speak, I love that your hand is has color in it. Can I just say that? <laughs> no, seriously, because so many emojis are defaulted or they don't even change, you know, like give you the option to change. So I love that you picked a hand that has color. Oh, Jay, you're so kind. That's no, you kind are. Kind thing to you say. have no idea. <laughs> you know, I love that. Um, Thank you. You know, I've heard both things. To speak to this at this moment, I've heard both things. Why are you doing this? You're white. Why are you doing this? You know, I, I, you can't see it. That's the <laughs> other thing. Yeah, but I kind of picked a neutral one. I don't know. You know. I need a green one. I need a purple one. Oh, I need something different. But let me say that, um, yeah, I think this is really rich, this discussion about forms, because it is about forms and what we're saying about the page numbers and is about forms mm -hmm. and about how we, um, go forward how we move with this okay it's this way 
And how do we react with that way? I mean, I'd like to say that I'm gonna go ahead and um, talk to the people that do doshi in the morning on, on weekdays about speaking about the page numbers. Um, I will bring to the all council meeting, which is kind of a, uh, a meeting of deciders about uh, repeating the quote on the second half or adding the quote, you know, taking a picture of the quote and putting it on the um, Google groups. Um, but I think all this is about form. I think it's so interesting. We're talking about specific detailed things and that's form and our relationship to form as opposed to saying, okay, whatever. And I wanted to say that the idea of we're gonna have this group and we're gonna talk about how do we do these forms and we're gonna get it right. No, it's gonna continue to move. It's gonna continue to shift and we have to, and that's life. And um, I wish, I'm, I'm a big wisher for let's get it one way and let's all do it the same way and let's do it that way forever. I mean, I love consistency. I think all of us do in some way, but it's like Flint says, it's like surfing. You're really reacting. You're reacting to the board. How much wax is there? Are you slipping? What is the wave like? What is the, is there something in front of you that you need to adjust? So surfing is a good analogy for our practice, I think. Thank you. Nice. I've used the surfing analogy ever since you shared it because I learned to surf for the first time at about 35 and it was an interesting experience. Quick aside, I was learning to surf in uh, Costa Rica and I was, I was living on the East Coast at that point. He said, where are you from? And I said, New York City. He said, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you're fighting the ocean. You're fighting the ocean. You're trying to control the ocean. Uh, and he said, that doesn't work. You need to listen to the ocean. Uh, and lo and behold, I didn't get up immediately thereafter, but I started playing with that. That became my sort of uh, koan. What does it mean to listen to the ocean on the surfboard? <laughs> uh, and I did manage to catch a wave or two. Uh, so thanks for sharing that one again. Um, I'd love to point us to a second piece and a, an opportunity for form in your home. And that was when I asked Peg, how how do we create this sense of, of form and connection? She said, I really would encourage people to have a home altar, even if it's something that, that's new to them. Um, and so I've, I've given you a brief little excerpt from uh, Robert Aiken on, on page 13. This is not the only way to build your, your um, uh, altar, but it's just some guidance for what it might look and sound like. I'll pass, I'm gonna post this back so folks can see this again. And I think that's there. Um, but I'd love for a couple of folks to just jump in and read this. And I'd love to hear from folks who have home altars and have started to do this, what's been your experience with them. Um, but why don't we read this a little bit together? Setting up your home altar from Taking the Path of Zen by Robert Aiken. Most of us cannot afford a separate room for Zazen, but all of us can make a corner sacred. Put your pad and cushion there with a low table or shelf for incense, flowers, and a picture of Shaka. Hmm. Shakyamuni. Thank yep. you. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Shakyamuni. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Bodhidharma, 
Kansion, Kans mm -hmm. okay, or one of the other great bodhisattvas or teacher teachers in our lineage. The room should be clean and tidy without too much sunlight. Through of though of course it should not be gloomy either. The spirit of religious dedication that is so apparent in the atmosphere of a training center can thus be evoking in your own home and in your own daily life. Shall I continue? Or? No, somebody else can jump in. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. On, on the one hand, uh, this religious setting should be spare, free from sentimental feeling that leads to self-preoccupation. The incense, for example, should not be sticky sweet. On the other hand, your setting for zazen should not be so arid that it has no religious associations. Some people find incense and pictures of the Buddha to be a threat to their rational spirit, but we most certainly cannot depend solely upon our rationality. Incense, pictures and flowers help to put us in touch with the wellsprings of universal spirit, drawing us to the oneness with our heritage and with our sisters and brothers that we already know intellectually to be the fact of our practice. They help us to establish meaningful archetypes of compassion and realization in our innermost being. Without such aids, Zazen may become just a kind of pop psychological psychology exercise on a level with books devoted to positive thinking. So I share that in part because it's provocative and interesting and curious what people think. Um, and because it answers no easy answers, offers no easy answers even in setting up a home altar, but it gives some interesting ideas. So curious what resonated with you in that. Uh, or if you have a home altar, how have you thought about that and uh, set that up? I know, Rosemary, you mentioned that you'd set one up a little while ago. So I'm um, curious to hear from you. But um, Well, I, I can move over and no. can I move a little closer? Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah. We love that. I love that. So let me just uh, do this. And uh, you tell me if, if what you're, you're saying it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, lovely. It's lovely. Yeah. So, um, and the um, the cards are, you know, folks that mm -hmm. are suffering and um, incense and the the column candle and the the votive candle and um, That's beautiful. my my new um candle snuffer. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, and I guess you could see the fabric, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I love the. You know, during no. the, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say during the um the the intensive at the beginning of the year, I I some I I'm pretty sure it was Peg, but you know, don't tie me to that. But um mentioned having a mirror on the altar, and I love that so much because as you look at the Buddha and you look, you realize you're also the Buddha in expression, and oh, yeah. it's a reminder of a um, divinity daily as we, you know, take meditation and stuff. So I love that. And that sat with me. That was, yeah, I remember that. That was Flint, I think. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And, um, I had a little mirror on there, but my, my objects have become so nice. I've up, kind of upgraded my objects and the mirror is really not so nice. And when Flint talked about this, he showed us this gorgeous, I don't know if you guys remember, but it was a very beautiful wooden, anyway, but I, I love that. And when I sit facing myself, it's it's a different experience. Yeah, uh, thank, thanks for watching. Yes, uh, and can I just take a steal a line from my Catholic days? <laughs> Render your heart and not your garment. So until you find a mirror that you like, that could suffice, no judgment, you know, in its form. I'm just okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it, it's it's coming back, Jay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> what else resonated with you about um, Aiken's work here? Any words that stood out or lines that are 
sitting with you as you think about the your home altar. Um, I like that, um, and I find this with Buddhism in, in general, that there is, you're not going to make it very fussy, the area very fussy, so there's a sense of calm, but it, it's not going to be, um, a, a, you know, um, so minimal that there's no feeling, you know, that there's no um, sense of life there, you know, I, li I like that middle kind of that middle way of um, making it personal, but also a uh, very common spare at the same time. Nate, I have a question. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Rosemary, are you complete? Yes. Okay. yes. Very well. Um, he mentioned that the incense should not be sticky sweet. And I'm like, that is very specific. Why? <laughs> I'm curious, why do you think? What's your what's your response to that? And why what would be the challenge of something that's quote unquote sticky sweet? I think it's a personal thing because me personally, I don't I don't like sweet, you know, even <laughs> when people buy me perfume and I always say don't buy me perfume because of that, I'm very particular. And for them, they don't think it's sweet. So that's why I'm like, why? why specifically say sticky sweet i just thought that was he I, in my head i'm like oh he must have had a really bad experience with some kind of <laughs> things, just don't make it sticky you know sweet because then it upset you know it made him feel queasy or something um so i was just asking you know because i i again i see i have a i am of a philosophy that you must find your own way. So if I have something sticky sweet, does it make it less than it? And I don't agree that it does. So, you know, these things that are uh, they're the guideposts, but other people may not see it as such. And so I was just curious why specifically say sticky sweet? I'd be making an inference about why, uh, you know, based on his preferences or otherwise that I couldn't mm. necessarily infer from the text itself. Okay. So I don't know. Okay. I don't exactly know. What I can say is he seems to be moving back and forth between almost the paradoxical sides of things, right? And trying to find a space so that you're create, cultivating a space uh, that embodies that simplicity in that middle way mm. rather than having your senses being drawn somewhere. So my working theory or idea would be something that's too much or grabs your attention in a particular way and doesn't allow you to settle into your practice. Mm -hmm. That's that's one possibility. And what do you think? You're muted. No, I'm mute. no, you're muted. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just wondering who we lost. I can't remember who was here and is not here. Oh, now. Lisa. It, it was Lisa. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. She said she had to, she had to leave for at two for an appointment. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know. Yeah, Claudine. Oh, yes. I didn't raise my hand, but I wanted to say something. <laughs> I, I love very much. Bur to burn sage mm. you know and it's such a pleasure this this smell is for me it uh, my my heart and soul goes with it with it i i can so it's such a pleasure it's not st stinky uh, no uh, sticky sweet, sweet surely not but it gives my it, it gives to me a, a real big pleasure so is it okay for this, for Mr. How is it named already? Aiken. A yeah. Aiken. Or is it, or should I choose something neutral? I think you're <laughs> probably just fine. <laughs> Good, thank you. I am, it's a big relief. <laughs> I do love Sage as well, Claudine. I, oh, it's such a pleasure. Yeah. And I had a, um, 
a sage cleanse like you know I'm, I'm yeah. from the Caribbean and we do all of that we burn and you know you walk through the house and you cleanse it and you put you know stuff so that yeah. um has a special place in my heart so I love sage I love I love, yeah. I love, I love it I do that sometimes too and uh we have a i'm in a group where we smudge ourselves to purify mm -hmm. and so yes. on. and my dogs love my dog loves sage <laughs> so much she comes and says i want some of it too <laughs> for my spirituality it's yeah. so funny <laughs> yes so and in milan what do you i see hands well i have this weird thing um that my mom brought from um arabia mm. and it's it's um i should show you oh see. wow it's a bunch of roots mm. that were that you are used as incense it's it's orris mm. root mm. it's actually orris root and then there's this piece of incense that is from Arabia also that has a lot of cinnamon. Um, it's really nice yeah. resinous incense. Um, so I would say, and I use a lot of incense. I buy incense from a place that um, does wild crafting on the west coast with lots of cedar and Douglas fir and things like that. So I don't think there's a right instance and a wrong instance. I mean, I think it's, yeah, I mean, I think it's a way to, it's, a, it's an interesting inquiry but I don't think there's a right and a wrong. My hunch is that there are probably reasons for certain kinds of incense that have a history and a tradition within certain things that I don't know that much about. And I'd be curious to know that so I can choose to participate in that or not or otherwise, but I don't think that, I think you're okay to sage up or go otherwise, Claudine. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, well, why don't we, uh, sit a little bit together uh, mm -hmm. if we can yes um, and before we sit can i just yeah. say um if you guys i recently got exposed to this and i loved it so i've continued um a cinnamon stick you set it up flame oh my god the aroma boom so you may want to try it too ah. and melin had a question oh i missed a comment so probably, um, well, I don't know if you can share some something to read about the meaning of each part of the altar. I once heard that the flowers means, I don't remember, but probably evanescence and things like that. So when you look at your altar, you remember all those elements and that's why you do it. So if you have something to read. So I have heard the the same about uh, about the the flower. Uh, you have an often have an image of the Buddha, or the Bodhisattva, as sort of a reminder of your Buddha nature. Um, I don't actually remember what the flame is. Anne, do you remember if there's a particular meaning for the flame? This is so wonderful <laughs> because it's. Uh, I mean, we there's so much more that stands behind what we're doing mm -hmm. um, about um, Taoism. And there's a bowl of water, mm -hmm. there's a rock, there's a flame. Those are pretty basic. And I think um, I, Malen, I don't know anything particularly about the, um, that you can read about the different elements of the altar. I'll search, but you can search too. Okay. Um, yeah. But I think it's back and back and back and back and back. I mean, I think it's so much more than just this particular practice. It's mm -hmm. the earth, 
the fire, the water, and the evanescence, like you were saying, of the flowers. Thank you. Um, the the guidance that I had to set this up was, um, and I could I can uh, share that um, was from the just this um, group, and they just had a few directions. You know, the flower is lower than the Buddha. The, you know, you're lighting the, the incense from the votive candle. And um, then you're putting the votive candle out. Those, just those little things. So I could, I could share that. And I did a little research in a similar way from different Zen centers. Uh, it's interesting. They, they have very different uh, understandings of what happens on an altar. Um, and very different directions about all of the flower <laughs> height. So it's, it's fascinating. Um, what I wonder is if, if you can, if you experiment a little bit with your altar and do it as intentionally as you can, like mm. what will emerge for you, uh, in your own practice. But I think you're going to find lots of interesting history and guidance. And there's, and it's form. It's what Nate started with, is form and how you relate to, did somebody tell me the way that it should be done? What do I feel like should happen? What's my understanding of what there is on the altar? It's all about our relationship to the form. And is it somebody else's? Is it ours? And what's the space between that? Yeah. So then speaking of form, um, I would love for us to uh, uh, mute if we can again and sit for a couple of minutes. Um, Last time we were together, we read a little bit of Dogen, and he gives some explicit instruction in uh, Fukin Zenji, Zazenji around how to sit. And as we sit today, I'll let everyone to resume their posture, and I'll sit in a particular way so you, you can see how uh, I choose to sit as best I can, um, and give you a little bit of instruction that might be helpful to you as you settle in. Uh, and then I'll share a different um, set of instructions from Suzuki Roshi while we're sitting, which you may have had a chance to read, um, which is a little bit different um, than Dogen, but may be nourishing to you and give us a chance to play in this space of form a little bit. So let me change a couple of things around. Did, did, did you want to did you want a timer yeah I've, I've got one so i'm okay okay it all rings for, for a couple of minutes thank you and as you settle into your chair and your cushion sometimes uh it's helpful to just sway briefly from the right to the left and sort of feel your spine get centered and in fact in some traditions and then that's part of the you'll see a very formal open-handed swaying um and as you settle into this space, if you are looking for, what does it look for a way to sit, sit upright with some dignity, with a slight curve in the back of your spine, so not hunched over, not so proud that it's putting stress on your the spinal column. Uh, but some, sometimes it's helpful to think of your spine as a stack of coins, so just nicely in a, a nice straight line up and down. Um, others, like to think of a string that's pulling your chest up at about a 45 degree angle. So it sort of pulls your chest up a little bit and keeps your posture straight. And another possibility is to think of a golden cord that's coming down through the top of your head along your spine and out your seat that is anchoring you straight up and down. So just find some comfort and ease and uprightness as you're sitting. And then I'll ring us in and we'll sit for a couple of minutes and I'll give you a little bit of direction from Suzuki Roshi. And 
Here's some thoughts from Suzuki Roshi on our practice. These forms are not the means of obtaining the right state of mind. To take this posture is itself to have the right state of mind. There is no need to obtain some special state of mind. The most important thing in taking the Zazen posture is to keep your spine straight. Your ears and your shoulders should be on one line. Relax your shoulders and push up towards the ceiling with the back of your head. And you should pull your chin in. Your hands should form the cosmic mudra. If you put your left hand on top of your right, middle joints of your middle fingers together and touch your thumbs lightly together as if you held a piece of paper between them, your hands will make a beautiful oval. You should keep this universal mudra with great care as if you were holding something very precious in your hand. You should not be tilted sideways, backwards, or forwards. You should be sitting straight up as if you were supporting the sky with your head. The most important point is to own your own physical body. If you slump, you will lose yourself. Your mind will be wandering about somewhere else. You will not be in your body. This is not the way. We must exist right here, right now. My bell is not very loud, forgive me. So let's pause and bow. So I'm curious, uh, how was that for you as you're listening to Suzuki Roshi's instructions? And forgive me for my, my bell seems to be uh, fading out. So I may need a new one. And ring very loudly. What stood out to you in the particular forms that Suzuki Roshi described, or what stood out to you in that experience? Rosemary, you're muted. You're muted. Yep. <laughs> um, the whole thing from the erect spine to the um, the lifting the back of the head to the sky and um, the, um, the the openness of the shoulders for that to me in particular is always about the open heart. So for me, the posture connects right to um, um, I think connecting um, first with my body and then with with I was thinking about this though this doesn't feel like connecting with others but it's it's um, it's just all all one that feels very um, there's some dignity to it and um, it's just a lift it's just a lift and uh, to me the openness of the heart to me is the, the biggest one is just keeping this this part open and yeah it feels wonderful thank you other experiences things that stood out for you in that short sit
curious about how you experienced that versus when we were talking about Dogan's instruction last time, a little bit different and sitting with that in mind. Are there things that resonated with you differently or particular pieces so from that, that stood out to you in his instruction? Well, his was less rigid, right? I didn't have to contort myself into a specific form in order, you know, if you understand what I mean. His was um, easily achievable just by being just sitting and which is what we do, right? You said you align yourself, you find your center and, you know, so that's definitely um, achievable by anyone with <laughs> the previous one, I had to be in my pretzel form. <laughs> left, left justified <laughs> my hand, you know, and you know, so definitely it's more welcoming somebody. Um, there are those who may have looked at the other one and said, you know what, I love a challenge and hey, let me do this. And uh, there are others who might have shied away from it because really I, I can't do this. And no, this is not for me. Whereas this one, it's, it's open arms. You know, there's no um, proving. <laughs> Yeah, no hurdles to jump over in order to, yeah, do it, so. And yet still a very precise form, yes. right? That's the interesting thing to me. I, I still am moved every time I hear this or I read this or hear it about the idea of holding a piece of paper between mm -hmm. uh, and that, that just, um, I don't know why that moves me. There's something gentle about holding that uh, mudra that feels precious. Uh, and the, the idea of holding a, a tiny piece of paper between your thumbs um, changes my posture almost instantly. And I like it because, Claudine, did you raise your hand? No. Oh, okay. I thought I saw off at of the corner. I like it because um, it, for me, it, it it creates a circle and I love circles because it just for me means um, wholeness and connectivity and one. So I love circles and I love that um, forming, you know. Of, so. And I was curious for your take because you had a, such a, um, you, I remember you responding strongly to Dogen and thinking about that last time. So I'm just curious as when you, what your response is to Suzuki Roshi here. I love Suzuki Roshi. I mean, I, I agree with Jay that it's more welcoming, that it's not, it's not so far away as Dogen. So, I, I love this, that it's gentle. Mm -hmm. There's something lovely about it's still precise, but gentle, uh, as opposed to maybe precise and uh, rigid pretzel. I, I sometimes when I read Dogen, I, um, I'm like, I don't, I can't do that. <laughs> That's the first thought that goes through my, my mind and my body. I literally can't make my body do those things. Um, so that's interesting. And dare we say snooty? <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, if you, now, I, I'm the, these words that I read to you are on the page 14 here with the little pictures that I gave you of the different forms that you can take. Um, just possibilities. So um, when I was giving orientation the other day, um, I was sharing with folks, I think um, that I can't sit full lotus. My That is not available to me. My body will not do that. So I can do, but the other postures are fairly available to me. Um, and so finding the one that sort of works for you um, is a starting point. My wife is just starting uh, to sit a little bit and she has, her hips will not accommodate most of these positions, which is in fact why the uh, the Zafu that you see on, that I'm sitting on is a, a different kind of Zafu than the traditional one because it's slants down in a little triangle. Um, 
so but that works for her because it allows her to sit a little bit differently or sit says uh, uh or sit in the chair so that's there are lots of different ways to, to experiment with form and still be really precise and gentle um nate i have a question mm -hmm. um with the chair i and this stood out last week but i didn't ask yeah. is the 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 rolled blanket i don't know or whatever is that specific or is it just in the picture you know it versus a um empty space beneath the chair there's a rolled blanket or a mat that's yeah the chair. it's the just the zabuton rolled up underneath though in our zendo we don't uh typically the chairs sit by themselves if i recall correctly and yes okay. It's just there's so there's not that's just one okay. particular take on it okay thank you um if you i wanted to, to spend just a little bit of time on the next page and as we think about form thinking about the breath and i'm curious how people relate to the breath right now in your sitting practice do you count uh do you note inhalations or exhalations like what is the quality of the breath like for you uh, because it can become a really useful sort of touchstone or meditation object in your practice, uh, especially as we wrestle with what um, Todd was describing the other day as not monkey mind so much as puppy mind. It was the puppy that strays away and then we have to bring it back. The breath can become that thing that we come back to, a gentle and soft way of returning. Um, so there are a couple of different pieces of guidance that folks will give. Uh, so Norman Fisher and Robert Aiken recommend breath counting on the exhalation. So either to five or to 10 and then repeating. So you're not counting in an endless loop. Your goal is not to count to 3000 and you've won some sort of prize, uh, but just to give you something to, to anchor to. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh has a breath practice of just simply on the inhale, labeling in and then out. And that's it. And just coming with the in and out because that keeps you out of the discursive whirl uh, that other words might bring. Uh, and then Suzuki Rossi has a wonderful quote about this swinging door that we'll get to, but I'm curious, how are people relating to the breath now? Well, for me personally, I always do um, a deep inhale and then I hold my breath at the top um, because I envision it flowing through my body and you know centering me and exhaling and then holding my breath on the um, out breath. And then um, I do this a few times and then I just find my natural rhythm and sit in it. But in order to ground, I do start with deep inhalations and just imagining it flowing through my body as I hold it. And then after that, it just, a natural rhythm for me. It's kind of the same to me. Can I just say, isn't it amazing though that when we take that breath in and you let it sit and then you like exhale out, but slowly how the body just drops in like settles in i just is amazing and you don't even realize that you've been holding your body up until you do that it's like oh shoot yeah it's i i'm now i i'm always fascinated by that i'm like oh my god i could feel my body dropping into itself it's incredible it's powerful yeah yeah um, I, I have lately been using some prompts like um, Analeo's um, body scan. So my mm -hmm. breath is pretty, um, pretty just natural. Um, and but it was the very first, um, um, I guess you could say meditation for me was the it was Thich Nhat Hanh with the inhale and the outhale, mm -hmm. the exhale and um, yeah, and um, I had many variations on that for a long time with the ocean um, wave out and wave in. 
Um, but uh, right now um, it's, but if I do get lost in my thoughts, I will come back to using the inhale and the outhale and outhale. That's okay. <laughs> Exhale. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Making up words. Um, yeah. So I, it, it's a, it's a wonderful touchstone um, for when I get lost. Yeah. Thanks. Even, uh, I think I've been sitting for the better part of a decade and last week when my when I find my mind is just whirling and I can sit and I'm filled with worry or tension, that simple return to the in, out, in, out somehow uh, often is the thing that gets me out of that discursive craziness. Um, Another thing that Kim was talking about this the other day, and I've heard this teaching as well before, to pay attention to the quality of your breath at the tip of your nose on the top of your lip, like paying attention to mm -hmm. on the inhale, the, the sort of cool sensation of it as you inhale, which we might do now, and just and then notice on the exhale, how it comes out just a little warmer, and that sensation as it leaves across uh, the top of your lips. That, that real subtle attention, that easy movement in and out, and not trying to control the breath, right? Not trying to manage it or deepen it, though you might start off with that, but to follow the breath. And that simple thing is to, uh, is a way to return. And Suzuki Roshi has this great quote, which I'll read for us and, and invite you to respond to. Uh, in the, the, as an invitation to consider breathing, what we call I is just a swinging door which moves when we inhale and when we exhale. When we practice zazen, our minds always follow our breathing. When we inhale, the air comes into the inner world. When we exhale, the air goes to the outer world. The inner world is limitless. The outer world is also limitless. We say inner world or outer world, but actually there is just one whole world. In this limitless world, our throat is like a swinging door. If you think I breathe, the I is extra. There is no you to say I. What we call I is just a swinging door which moves when we inhale and we exhale. It just moves, that is all. When your mind is pure and calm enough to follow this movement, there is nothing, no I, no world, no mind nor body, just a swinging door. This was one of the first teachings I ever received in Zen and it continues to be one of the more profound ones. I'm curious how folks experience the swinging door and that attention to breath. I think it's wonderful. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, but I, lo I love the idea of sweeping. You're sweeping in and you're sweeping out, and um, and that's all. You know, that's all. It's very um, relieving in a way, like releasing mm -hmm. burdens. I love that idea of just sort of loosening the hold of the eye. That there's just a there's just something that's functioning and doing and there's nothing to cling to or worry about. Nate, and I you just expressed that it was profound for you. Can you mm -hmm. go into a little bit more detail? Are you willing to share with us? Yeah, I, I think the for me, the idea that um the, what we call I is a swinging door. It's like we're just seeing this thing as a um, as a construction, as something that is moved by the breath rather than mm. something that is um, solid and needs defending or that is animating all action. It goes, if, the, if you just treat this I uh, a little more gently, then um, instead of experiencing the eye as the source of things, I just experience it as being animated by something else. So it changes my understanding of agency a little bit in a way that I found helpful. 
Yeah. And because, thank you, mate. And because my mind is what it is, I'm like, that eye is so fickle. It just moves with the <laughs> <laughs> It just not goes away. <laughs> it's not solid. It's not fixed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yes. But yes. Um, as I'm looking at time, I think the, the reason I wanted to spend time on form here was just because to invite you to experiment with form and to enjoy the beauty of these forms whether that's sitting on your own and what is available to you or setting up your own altar and, and so on and so forth i think there's um or participating in sangha in our shared forms and what becomes available to you uh we're not going to get to the, the other pieces here that i think might be worth the time and energy if you want to learn a little bit more about the Four Noble Truths or the Eightfold Path and some of the origins of the language and these these kind of cornerstones and the, the Dharma and then our practice is available to you here. Um, but I was more curious, what are the things you're wondering about and questioning? So way back when on Jamboard, some folks have put up some interesting questions, which I'll resurrect in a minute. But um, I'm just curious, what is coming up for you? What are you working with or questioning or wondering about as you engage in this practice? Someone asked a question about why it's so hard for beginners, and I didn't know who it was, but I wanted to, wanted to, I'll toss that one out first of just, what does that mean for the who are bitter? What does it mean to be a beginner, you said? Why is it so hard for beginners, somebody asked. I, I think that would depend on the beginner. Um, and, and what's hard, um, I think for me, um, I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, I, you know, I started meditating. So I thought, well, I, I knew Flint a little bit. I said, well, you know, maybe I'll go to an intensive or sit with these folks. And I, I was, um, the challenge for me um, in this year and a half has been just learning things about myself that, you know, I thought I was fairly self-aware, but little did I know, this is a whole other dimension of investigation. And um, yeah, um, so um, I don't know about other beginners, but that that would probably be the thing that I um, was most surprised with and, and enriched by, you know, or I wouldn't still be here. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, that was a big, just just a whole other dimension, so. You know, was not prepared that there would be such a thing. So, and I don't know. Yeah. Oh, Milan, yeah. Go ahead. I can go after you. Oh, I just wanted to. I think that I. I it makes me come back to Suzuki Roshi's idea of beginner's mind, right? I'm coming mm -hmm. back to um, being a little uh, less certain, a little on a, less attached to what we think we know, and to meet everything as a fresh, new in a fresh new moment by moment way. So I think some ways that beginner's mind is hard because you're snapping out of that way that you've been thinking and yet it's perpetually the practice. So in some ways uh, it's a practice you're just starting and continuing in perpetuity. <laughs> mm -hmm. Milan. Thank you. I was going to say something similar uh, to, to um, be in the present moment and to adopt um, all this knowledge. So um, if someone else could like to read the Four Noble Truths, uh, I could be interested to do it now. Yeah. You can if you'd like to go that way. Sure. Um, so why don't we do that together and then we'll leave the full path at least so you can see what the, those eight are. So on the page 17, what we do for, I'll read the first one and somebody can pick up after. So the first noble truth, just these are succinctly put versions of them. There are other versions that are available. Human life is characterized by dukkha, literally a wheel out of kilter, often translated as dissatisfaction, disease, stress, or suffering. It's probably most commonly translated as suffering, though that is a little bit, um, that doesn't capture the full essence of it. 
at Alpha Model, we often use the term dissatis dissatisfaction or dissatisfying. Let me get the second. Together with dukkha arises thirst, craving, desire, wanting, including aversion, samudaya. Mm -hmm. That thirst which is arising can be contained. The container of that energy leads to transformation. Naredha? Naroda. Yeah, Naroda. That transformation manifests as a life unfolding according to the Eightfold Path, Marga. Mm -hmm. And here are the, the eight parts of the Eightfold Path are detailed below, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right meditation. And here, I really love the words from uh, the teacher, Steve Hagen, who says here, right does not mean as of right as opposed to wrong. The term the Buddha used, Sama, is more closely means appropriate, or this works, or in sync with reality. It refers to being in touch with reality rather than being deluded by your own thoughts, prejudices, and beliefs. So every time you see that word right, and in fact, that word right gets uh, a lot of play inside of our uh, path and, and our tradition, think that in accord with life, right? Um, for me, this is, I am so steeped in a Judeo tra uh, Christian tradition that I, it's hard to get out of the moralistic right and wrong terms. Um, but that is an important understanding to have here. As you're looking at the, the Four Noble Truths in particular, before we dive into any more detail around the Eightfold Path, what stands out to you or what are you wondering about? I have no comment about that, but I just want to go back to the um, the beginner's mind. Why is it so difficult for beginners? I can't speak for anybody else, but on my journey um, was the taking responsibility for everything that happens in my life and um, dismantling like what I thought was true right mm. but um which meant that I had to rebuild and being like 100% honest with myself because I even in the beginning I realized that <laughs> I was defaulting to the <laughs> um not to lies and not being honest with myself getting to the root because it meant that I had to be like basically naked to myself and that was um a journey in of itself so uh, that was my struggle you know um to get me to the path I'm on now and it's like in a way it's like um you know when people physically hit rock bottom that was my rock bottom like being <laughs> I don't know how to put, I could see it in my head, like just with nothing, nothing. And then that um, new creation in, in new creating, but you know, like being unfettered by all the other stuff, right? Like a, a baby starting over. So, and it's releasing all those things when outside messages are saying, no, you need it. <laughs> Oh gosh, yeah. yeah. I get, there's a lot of that even now, you know. Uh, um, even when people, when individuals try to hold me to the person I used to be, and it's like, well, even I'm telling, even before I entered the room, they're telling other people, or oh, she's. I'm like, why are you holding me to the way I used to be? And and I own it. I'm like, yeah, I used to be that because I wasn't aware, you know, I was in pain, and therefore. 
I'm, I wasn't, I, I didn't acknowledge or didn't even know that that was um, creating certain responses in me, but I'm not that anymore. And I'm like, let that go, you know? So it's um, just that being, that was my struggle. It sounds like in, inside of this, there are two things that really stood out to me. One is that you said when you hit rock bottom, so when you have this sort of profound experience of dukkha, right? Um, and I think I've said this before that Flint has often said that people often come to this practice because they hit bottom and they realize the way they've been living doesn't work anymore or because they see something in someone else that they uh, admire and say, I want that. And often in Flint himself, right? You'll see Flint and say, there's something about him. I don't can't put my finger on that, but I want to be in the presence of that and that admire and that becomes an aspiration. Um, and it also sounds like you're describing a, like the gut-wrenching part of coming into right view, which mm -hmm. is letting loose of those old views that you held um, as you start to see things as they really are, rather than through the lens of the self that has been driving things for so long. I so. I'm, I'm curious, so others have experienced the four, four noble truths or what you know, brings you here in light of this. So uh, my, my hunch is that these are, some of these things bring you here. And by here, I mean to this practice, not necessarily to this sitting here with each other right now, but. I, I cannot express fully, but the, to me it's um, a beautiful reminder about what life is in a positive way mm -hmm. and how to let go the rest. Yeah. yeah. The letting go was the hardest part for me. <laughs> yes. I'm curious if you look at the eightfold path and the eight pieces that are laid out here. Is there one of these that resonates with you more than right now for where you are? Whether it's seeing things as they clearly are, right intention, right speech, you can see the sort of descriptors of each. And given where you are on Saturday, March 19th, is one of these kind of either an edge for you or speaking to you in your life right now? Remember, this is how that transformation, that is, this is how suffering gets transformed, is relating to things through these, being in accord with life in these handful of ways. Um, so, okay, um, right effort. So um, the energetic will to prevent unwholesome, unwholesome states of mind. Um, at the end of my day, each day, after my responsibilities are done, I, you know, I just kind of check out and I, um, I want to have my TV and my snacks and um, I, you know, so that's what I'm sort of, I know, and this is through the precepts um, class that when we were talking about um, drugs and stuff like that, but it was about any, any compulsion, which I consider TV watching for me to be in that category. You know, what, so when you're sitting there, Rosetto says in her, when you're sitting there about to turn the TV on, what's going on? And um, I did it like once or twice and it was very fruitful because I was pretty sad. Um, and um, I'm getting sad now <laughs> thinking about it. So that's my, that's my edge right now. Mm -hmm. My nights. Thank, you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for being vulnerable and for yeah. sharing that. Thank you, Rosemary. 
Is there another one of the, uh, or some, what else is someone else meeting or working with in their life right now? Claudine. Oh, we got to mute Claudine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I realize reading them all that very often I don't pay enough attention to the right intention. Mm. I mean, I, and it's like to have an addiction, like uh, addiction, like uh, look at the TV or eat too much. I remember eating too much at the time in my life and having a real blank or a, a, a black spot, going to the fridge, taking something, eating it, and then beginning to think again after I had eaten. But mm -hmm. during a while, it was in between brackets. And as if the intention of how, why do I do something was also in, in between brackets. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it is, um, yes, to, to be able to act with intention, to have a right, the right intention, and to be aware of my intention before I open my mouth or before I begin to act. That is a very important point for me, I think. Mm -hmm. Voila. Complete. Thank you, Claudine. Thank you for sharing that. You know, um, I don't know if it really pertains to the Eightfold Path, but um, Claudine was saying something, and um, I read a past. Uh, I read something that um, made me start thinking that everything is uh, sacred, right? Because everything is made up of the same thing I am. And I have a, <laughs> I have a big issue who, I, this is my personal journey, right? So I have a big issue about people complaining about, um, I'm not eating animals and I'm like, trees are sentient too and you know as you carelessly you know cut down a tree or and as an environmentalist too these issues are big for me so um but I had said you know I, I wanted to be more mindful when I'm eating because I realized that when I would consume food I I gave no thought to it I was just like shoveling food into my mouth you know while I'm on my phone or watching tv and stuff and that has been for me the hardest thing to break because it's that you know quoting that oh I could be accomplishing so much <laughs> other stuff while I'm eating you know and um so seriously like taking the time off I'm I did it for a week and there are times when I forget but then I when I in the middle, even if I remember in the middle, I, I give pause and be mindful when I'm eating because I'm like, um, I savor the, that spoonful, you know what I mean? Like, and I, I think to myself, I need to give reverence to the, those, the, the, the life that was taken in order to give me sustenance, right. To give me, um, life and presence. <laughs> this is just my thinking. Um, yeah, so it's just right intention. And if I am a divine being, right, I'm divine being, I'm, would I shovel food into a baby's mouth? No, I, I, I take time and I let the baby, you know, like, um, process the food. And yet with myself, I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's like, ah, be mindful, Janelle, you know, take a spoon and um, would, uh, be reverent about my consumption. But that's my, that's my journey, be reverent in what I'm eating and focus on that rather than, okay, watch TV and just shovel or look at the computer. So the right intention triggered that in my head. But yeah, that, that has been a journey for me this year. Thank you. On that note, I'll, I'll give you a, a meal chance. <laughs> 
uh, mm. the, or I'm point you to the meal chant in the chant book. It's on page 43, but I'll just okay. let you, uh, I can read this for you because there's, I'd love for you to sit with this, Jay. And I think it's kind of a nice place to respond to that and even to what to sort of wind us down for today. Mm. So at our, some of our meals, you'll hear us chant this. 72 labors brought us this food. We mm. should know how it comes to us. And we receive this offering. As we receive this offering, we should consider whether we understand its nature. As we desire the natural order of the mind to be free from clinging, we must be aware of our greed. We take this food to support our life. We take this food to attain the way. First, this food is for true practice. Second, is for our teachers and parents. Third, it is for all nations and all beings. Thus, we eat this food with everyone. We eat to stop all harming, to practice serving, to accomplish the awakened way. Mm. May we ex exist like a lotus at home in the muddy water. Thus, we bow to life as it is. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. I thought as uh, you're thinking about right intention and eating mindfully, that might be a nourishment to you. Um, and I feel like a good way to, for us to wind down and just saying how lovely it's been to be with you oh. in, in our muddy water together uh, over these past three Saturdays. So thank you so much for uh, giving you your time and offering your warmth and connection to one another and for letting me be part of that. So uh, it's been a delight to be with you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nate. you so much. Thank you. Thank you for creating great. a space for this to happen and to feed us, right? This is all food, so. Right. Yeah. That's right. I hope to see you all again very soon. <laughs> we will. Absolutely. Bye, Bye everybody. Care. Bye, Be guys. Well. Bye. Bye. And thank you, Rosemary. Oh, you're welcome.